All right, gardening enthusiasts, ready to tackle those gardening challenges we all face sometimes. Absolutely. We're diving deep into 100 problems new gardeners experience. Yeah. And, you know, even seasoned pros like a refresher sometimes, right? Oh, absolutely. And what I appreciate about this book is its problem-solving approach. Mm -hmm. It's like having a seasoned gardener, like guiding you every step of the way, yeah. anticipating those oh-no-what-now moments. Exactly. So forget those information overload headaches. Think of this like a cheat sheet to a healthier, happier garden. I like that. Starting with a problem that even, I think, even experienced gardeners encounter yes. over watering. Yeah. I mean, we've all been there, right? Yeah. Drowning our plants with kindness. More common than you think. Really? You see, we often focus on the above ground action. Right. But what's happening beneath the soil is just as critical. Okay. Roots need to breathe. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. Roots breathing. Tell me more. It's all about oxygen. Okay. Just like we need oxygen to breathe, roots need it to absorb nutrients effectively. Interesting. When the soil is constantly waterlogged, those tiny air pockets disappear. Right. And it's like trying to breathe underwater. Oh, wow. The book describes those poor roots basically suffocating. Ah. It makes you want to check your soil right now, doesn't it? It really does. The book mentions well-draining soil and pots with drainage holes, which I know are essential, but what really clicked for me was a tip about using a moisture meter. Yes. Have you found those helpful? A moisture meter is like having x-ray vision for your soil. It takes all the guesswork out of watering. Instead of just looking at the surface, you can actually see how much moisture is down at the root level. The book does a great job explaining how even beginners can interpret the readings dry, moist, wet, and adjust their watering accordingly. So it's all about finding that sweet spot, right? Not too dry, not too wet, just the right amount of moisture for happy roots. Exactly. And that leads us perfectly to our next challenge, which is all about harnessing the power of the sun, getting enough light to those leaves. The book puts it boldly. Want healthier plants? Let the sunshine in. Yeah. It's true, though. I mean, who doesn't crave a little sunshine? But how do we know if our gardens are getting enough? It all boils down to those magical hours of sunlight. Most plants thrive on a solid six to eight hours each day. Wait, six to eight straight hours? That seems like a lot. Well, it doesn't have to be direct, intense sunlight the entire time. The book actually suggests observing your garden throughout the day to see how the light moves across the space. Okay. You might be surprised by how much sun or shade different areas receive even in the same yard. That's a good point, and this is where choosing the right plant for the right spot is crucial. If you have a shady haven, you can still have a thriving garden. Exactly. The book highlights shade-loving superstars like ferns and hostas, mm -hmm. which absolutely flourish in those lower light conditions. And for those of us battling limited natural light, like my friends up north or those with indoor jungles, the book mentions grow lights. Yes. Now, those are a game changer, especially during those dark winter months. Speaking of things that can wreak havoc in the garden, let's talk about pests. Ah, yes, the battle against those hungry critters. The book paints such a vivid picture. Is your garden turning into a buffet for bugs? Oh. It's a valid concern, but there are ways to protect your precious plants without resorting to harsh chemicals. Okay, so tell me more about these organic pest control methods. Everyone wants a healthy garden, but nobody wants to spray harmful chemicals all over the place, right? Exactly. And what's fascinating is that some of the most effective solutions are found right in nature itself. Neem oil, for example, derived from the neem tree, acts as a natural insecticide and fungicide. It's like magic in a bottle. I've also heard great things about insecticidal soap. It's another excellent option. But here's where it gets really interesting. The book delves into the concept of companion planting. Oh, I've heard whispers of this technique. Tell me everything. <laughs> it's about strategically planting different species together for their mutual benefit. Okay. Think of it as creating a harmonious ecosystem in your garden. Right. For instance, planting marigolds alongside your tomatoes isn't just for a splash of color. They actually deter certain pests. Wait, really? So those cheerful marigolds are like the garden guardians? How does that work? Marigolds contain a compound that repels nematodes. Okay. Which are microscopic worms that can damage plant roots. Oh. They're basically setting up a force field around your tomatoes. That is incredible. Are there other dynamic duos we should know about? Absolutely. Another powerful pairing mentioned in the book is basil and tomatoes. Oh, yeah. Not only do they taste divine together thing, like fresh caprizza salad, but basil also helps repel aphids, white flies, and even those pesky tomato hornworms. It's like building a little army of protector plants. I love that. Precisely. 
And this idea of companion planting beautifully illustrates the book's message of working with nature right. rather than against it. Yeah. You know? It's about understanding those intricate relationships between different plants. Yes. And using that knowledge to our advantage. Speaking of timing, let's move on to another challenge, harvesting at the perfect moment. I love the way the book frames it. Harvesting at the perfect time, here's how you'll know. Love it. It's so true. Timing is everything, especially when it comes to flavor and texture. Picking your fruits and vegetables at their peak ripeness can make all the difference. Oh, I'm with you there. A perfectly ripe tomato straight from the vine, nothing beats that. Exactly. And the book provides some really helpful cues for knowing when the time is right. For instance, waiting for tomatoes to reach that beautiful full color and become slightly firm to the touch ensures you're getting the most flavorful experience. And for leafy greens, the book says to harvest before they start to bolt, Yeah, which is when they send up a flower stalk. Apparently that can make them taste bitter, good to know. Yeah. But with so much to keep track of, remembering when everything is ready to harvest feels like a challenge in itself. It can be, especially for us gardening enthusiasts who get a little overexcited about planting, like every variety under the sun. The book's tip about keeping a garden journal really resonated with me. Me too. It seems so simple, but it makes a world of difference. It's like having a personal logbook for your garden's journey. Right. You can note when things were planted, track their growth, and even jot down those handy seed packet guidelines for harvesting times. And then imagine next season, you pull out your trusty garden journal, and bam, you're a master of timing, amazing your friends and family with perfectly right produce. Precisely. It's a fantastic practice for any gardener, no matter their experience level. Speaking of things we can't see but are vital to a thriving garden, let's talk about soil nutrient deficiency. Right. It's easy to get caught up in the sunlight and the watering, but what's happening beneath the surface is just as important. The book asks, is your garden starving for nutrients? Now, that's a question I haven't really considered before. It's all about nourishing the foundation. Just like we need a balanced diet to thrive, plants require a variety of nutrients from the soil. And over time, those nutrients can become depleted, especially with repeated planting. So it's like constantly drawing from the same bank account without making any deposits? Yes. Eventually, you're going to run out of funds. Exactly. The book highlights the importance of replenishing those vital nutrients. Adding organic compost, for example, is like serving up a gourmet buffet for your plants. I love that analogy. So we're talking nutrient-rich, decomposed organic matter that slowly releases those essential elements back into the soil. Precisely. And the book also mentions using a well-balanced fertilizer if needed. But how do we know what our soil needs? It's not like our plants can just hand us a shopping list, right? I know. It's not as easy as looking for wilting leaves or something. That's where soil testing comes in handy. Right. It's like a blood test for your garden, revealing any deficiencies or imbalances. The book recommends checking your soil's pH level which measures its acidity or alkalinity. Okay, so a quick science recap for those of us who haven't thought about the pH scale since high school chemistry. pH influences how easily plants can absorb nutrients. Yeah. It's like if the pH is off, those nutrients are locked away in a vault and the plants can't access them. That's a great way to put it. And the ideal pH range for most plants falls somewhere between six and seven. Okay. Although some have specific preferences. Mm -hmm. Once you know your soil's pH, you can make adjustments using amendments like lime to raise pH or sulfur to lower it. It's all about finding that balance. The book also mentions some interesting amendments for boosting soil fertility, like bone meal, which is a good source of phosphorus, and seaweed extract, which is packed with micronutrients. Nature has provided us with some incredible tools for gardening success. Now shifting gears a bit, let's talk about something that seems counterintuitive but is crucial for a thriving garden, giving your plants space to breathe. Right. The book puts it so well. Want a fuller garden? Give your plants room to breathe. It seems counterintuitive because you think more plants, fuller garden, but it's not quite that simple. Exactly. It's about quality over quantity. Okay. When plants are crammed too close together, they have to compete for those precious resources we've been discussing. Sunlight, water, nutrients. It's like being stuck on a crowded train. Eventually, everyone's personal space bubble gets a little too close for comfort. So instead of thriving and reaching their full potential, they end up stunted and struggling to survive. Precisely. Yeah. And nobody wants that for their plants. The book reminds us to consult those trusty seed packets. Yes. Which usually include recommended spacing guidelines. Even if you've already planted, it's not too late. 
thinning out seedlings early on can make a world of difference. It's like giving those little seedlings a fighting chance, right? Exactly. Now let's move on to a universal gardening challenge that never seems to go away completely. Weeds. I swear they have a knack for popping up at the worst possible moment. Don't they, though? The book asks, are weeds taking control of your garden? I have to admit, there have been times when I felt like throwing in the trowel and surrendering to those relentless invaders. Weeds are masters of resilience. But in all seriousness, they can be a major nuisance, stealing those precious resources from our cultivated plants and even introducing diseases. So how do we fight back without resorting to, well, you know, extreme measures? No flamethrowers needed. The book outlines several practical and effective strategies. Okay. Mulching, for example, is a gardener's secret weapon. Okay, mulch. Tell me everything. It always seemed like one of those extra steps to me, but now I'm intrigued. It's a game changer. Just like we mulch to protect the soil during the winter months, applying a layer around our plants during the growing season helps suppress weed growth. So it's like creating a physical barrier that blocks sunlight and makes it harder for those pesky weed seeds to sprout. Exactly. The book also suggests using a weed barrier fabric beneath the mulch for added protection. Okay especially in areas prone to invasive weeds. That's a great tip. I can see how that would save a lot of weeding headaches down the road. It's all about working smarter, not harder, in the garden. Now, speaking of patience, the book tackles a challenge that many gardeners face, the struggle with delayed gratification. Oh, I feel this one deeply. It's like we plant those tiny seeds, nurture them with care, and then we wait and wait. And sometimes that waiting feels never ending, especially when we're bombarded with images of perfectly ripe produce on social media. It's true. Gardening is a wonderful practice in patience. The book encourages us to embrace the process, find joy in those daily rituals of tending to our plants, and remember that every plant has its own unique timeline. Easier said than done sometimes, right? Especially for those of us who are naturally impatient. Absolutely. The book offers a great suggestion for those times when we need a little boost of instant gratification. Planting fast-growing crops alongside our slower-growing veggies. Oh, I like where you're going with this. So things like radishes and lettuce that we can harvest and enjoy while those tomatoes and peppers are taking their sweet time. Exactly. It's a great way to experience those early wins and stay motivated throughout the season. Love it. Okay, speaking of finding the right fit, let's talk about something I know I've struggled with in the past. Choosing plants that are well-suited to my climate. I'm talking full-on gardening fail moments here. You've all been there. Remember that lavender fiasco? Don't remind me. I had visions of fragrant lavender fields, and instead I got, uh, well, let's just say it wasn't pretty. The book asks a very pointed question. Are your plants wilting under the wrong conditions? Ooh, that one hit close to home. So how do we avoid those mismatches and set ourselves up for success? It starts with understanding your unique growing environment. Okay. Before you even purchase a single seed or seedling, take some time to research your climate and hardiness zone. Hardiness zones, for those who are new to this, basically tell you the average temperature range in your area. Right. They help you choose plants that are most likely to thrive in those conditions, right? Exactly. It's all about working with nature, not against it. The book also suggests looking to native plants for inspiration. That makes sense. Native plants are like the seasoned pros of the plant world. They've already adapted to the specific challenges and conditions of your region over centuries. Exactly. They've stood the test of time, and they can teach us a lot about what works best in our own backyards. It's like having a built-in guide to successful gardening. Now let's talk about something that's often overlooked, even by experienced gardeners. Fertilizing. The book asks, is your garden growing slow? You might be forgetting this crucial step. I have to admit, I've definitely been guilty of neglecting fertilizer at times. It's easy to do, especially when we're all caught up, yeah. you know, in the excitement of planting and watering. Right. But just like we need those extra vitamins and minerals sometimes. Yeah. Our plants benefit from a little boost too. Okay, so fertilizing is like giving our gardens that extra nutritional support they need to truly thrive. Precisely. It helps them access those essential nutrients for strong roots, vibrant foliage, and ultimately, a bountiful harvest. 
Okay, so when we talk about fertilizer, what type are we talking about? The book seems to really emphasize the organic options. It does, and for good reason. Yeah. Organic fertilizers are like a slow and steady release of nutrients, mimicking nature's way. Okay. They're derived from natural sources like compost, bone meal, and blood meal. Right. They're gentler on your plants and the environment, and over time, they help improve your soil structure. It's a win-win-win. Healthier plants, healthier soil healthier environment. But I have to ask, what about over fertilizing? Is that a thing? It absolutely is. Mm -hmm. It's tempting to think that if a little is good, then more must be better. But that's not the case with fertilizer. The book cautions against going overboard because it can actually harm your plants and even lead to nutrient imbalances in the soil. So it's all about finding that sweet spot once again. Yes. Not too much, not too little, just the right amount of fertilizer to keep those plants happy. Exactly. Now let's dive into another aspect of gardening that often trips up new gardeners. Watering technique. Okay. You might be surprised to learn that there's actually a right and wrong way to water your plants. You're kidding. I have to admit, I thought watering was pretty straightforward. The book asks, are you watering your plants the wrong way? Okay, now I'm a little worried. How could I be messing up something as simple as watering? You'd be surprised how many gardeners don't realize that their watering technique could be harming their plants. Really? It's not just about getting the soil wet. It's about doing it in a way that benefits the plant and doesn't create problems. Okay, so spill the tea. What's the wrong way to water, and how do we make sure we're doing it right? Imagine this. You're giving your plants a refreshing shower with the hose, mm -hmm. aiming that jet of water right at the leaves and stems. Yeah. Seems harmless enough, right? Right. But all that splashing can actually damage delicate foliage and create the perfect environment for fungal diseases to take hold. Really? I had no idea. So splashing water on the leaves is a no-no. It's best to avoid it whenever possible. The book emphasizes watering at the base of the plant, directly at the soil level. This ensures the water goes straight to the roots, where it's needed most, while keeping the foliage relatively dry. That makes perfect sense. The book also mentions something called drip irrigation, which I've always been curious about. Yeah. Is that what I think it is? It is. It's like setting up a mini irrigation system for your plants. Okay. Basically, it involves a system of tubes or hoses with emitters that slowly release water directly to the root zone, either on a timer or through gravity. So no more dragging that heavy watering can around or accidentally blasting my plants with a powerful jet of water. Exactly. Drip irrigation is a fantastic way to conserve water, minimize weed growth because you're not watering that entire area, and reduce the risk of those pesky fungal diseases we talked about. That's amazing. I can see how that would be a game changer for busy gardeners or those who want to be more water wise. It is. And it's another great example of how understanding a few key principles can make a world of difference in the health and productivity of our gardens. This deep dive has been a treasure trove of gardening wisdom. We've covered so much ground today, from the importance of healthy soil and proper watering techniques, to companion planting, and even the art of patience. I feel like I've graduated from Gardening 101 with honors. I love that. And remember, even seasoned gardeners were once beginners, navigating the trials and triumphs of growing their own food. The key is to approach those challenges with curiosity, a willingness to learn, and a little help from resources like, you know, 100 Problems New Gardeners Experience. Couldn't agree more. So to our listeners out there, embrace the journey, celebrate those victories, big or small, and never stop experimenting in the garden. Well said. Until next time, happy gardening, everyone.